to make the welcoming remarks, I am delighted to introduce the head of research at the Nordic Africa Institute, Professor Eleanor Fisher. Thank you very much, Jim. Excellencies, civil society representatives, colleagues and participants, a warm welcome on behalf of the Nordic Africa Institute, Peace and Research Institute of Oslo and the University of Pretoria to the second round table discussion on the theme, the UN Security Council, its elected 10 and the role of civil society. This is really welcomed here at the Nordic Africa Institute, a Swedish government agency that undertakes high quality research on relevant societal challenges in Africa. We collaborate with the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, PRIO, and the University of Pretoria on this project, which investigates the linkages between elected members of the Security Council and the promotion on the women, peace and security agenda. This is one of three ongoing projects involving researching the Security Council. We're glad to have researchers and advisors from those projects also here today. This is the second round table in a series of two. The overarching purpose of the series is to exchange knowledge and expertise on the UN Security Council's group of elected member states in favor of women, peace and security. We hope this webinar will also encourage more exchange of experiences of cooperation between E10 states and civil society, especially lessons for generating timely, relevant and effective UN Security Council outcomes for women, peace and security. In focus today is the past, present and future civil society briefing of the United Nations Security Council, particularly focusing on African inputs from civil society briefers. The discussion will include an exchange of insights about the evolving practices of briefing the council and the opportunities and challenges of African civil society women briefers. The principles of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals anchor our work at the Nordic Africa Institute and underline the vital importance of peace, security and human rights, and also, of course, gender equity and inclusion. On that note, before handing over to Angela, I would also like to take this opportunity to especially thank Ms. Nasiwa, Founder and National Director, Centre for Inclusive Governance, Peace and Justice, and Ms. Lusumba, Executive Coordinator, Sophie Paddy, for participating and providing their perspectives and experiences to the discussion. We're keen to listen to and learn from your insights briefing the UN Security Council today. Additionally, I would also like to thank Dr. Castillo Diaz, Policy Specialist on Peace and Security UN Women. Ms. Ahsoka, Executive Director, NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security. Dr. Mbete, Senior Lecturer, University of Pretoria and Professor Zondi, Professor of Politics, International Relations, University of Johannesburg, for adding valuable nuances and perspectives for today's discussion. Lastly, I would also like to thank our partners at PRIO and the University of Pretoria for their participation. I will now hand over to Dr. Mavumba Selström, Angela, who will provide an overview of today's programme. Angela will also introduce the other speakers and moderate the Q&A at the end, we do encourage you to participate with questions. Thank you very much and a warm welcome. Angela, over to you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. It gives me great pleasure to see this event become a reality. Uh, we've been working for several years now with the Peace Research Institute of Oslo and for this year with the University of Pretoria on establishing greater understanding of how the elected 10, particularly African states, advance human peace and security in the council. An outcome of our report, uh, Prio's report, and our report on Sweden as an elected member in the UN Security Council was the way in which civil society played such a critical role in both generating new insights and ideas and experiences and pushing uh, Sweden and other elected states to become more innovative and creative in terms of proposing concrete context re relevant solutions to peace and security issues. And how the involvement of civil society 
was such an integral part of this strategic objective. Our aim today is exactly as Eleanor described it. Uh, we would really appreciate the opportunity to play our small role in helping to create a space for both honoring the voices of Africans from civil society in the work of women, peace and security through the UN Security Council, and also provide creating a space that enables critical reflections on the role of civil society briefers. So I expect today to be an opportunity to gather up new forms of knowledge and new insights, both experiential knowledge and policy relevant knowledge from practitioners such as Dr. Pablo Castillo Diaz and Ms. Kavya Asoka, and of course, our civil society briefers, Jacqueline Nasiwa and Sandrine Lusamba. We're also very, very pleased that we'll have an academic perspective from Dr. Susan Belembete, who will talk about the challenges of civil society in Africa in particular, and who comes to us and is part of our work and project and with, is with us today. Also, uh, based on her special particular expertise, having already conducted quite a bit of research on South Africa's foreign policy during its two elected terms in the UN Security Council. So I would like to just begin by briefly sort of mapping out how this session, how today's webinar will, will go, what, what, will, what, what the process will be. Our first intervention or contribution will be from Dr. Pablo Castillo Diaz. We'll talk about the past or rather the history of women briefers. And then we will turn to the present where we will hear from Jacqueline Nasiwa and Sandrine Lusamba, and finally Kavya Asoka about the present or the current challenges and experiences and realities of civil society briefing on WPS. And then lastly, we'll listen to Dr. Sitembele Mbeti about the future and challenges and opportunities facing civil society. We'll close with a, with a a brief wrap up from Dr. Uh, Professor Sipaman Lazondi. Um, but before that, there will be an opportunity for some Q&A and some questions. I will have some questions, I'm sure, and there will also be some contributions from the, the, the Q&A uh, from the audience members. So let me introduce Dr. Pablo Castilla, Castillo Diaz, who's, as you've heard, a policy specialist at at Peace, Security, and Humanitarian Section at UN Women. Uh, he studied political science in Madrid and has a PhD in global affairs from Rutgers University and is an expert, really, I can say, on the UN Security Council uh, and Women, Peace, and Security. So with that, let me turn the floor to Pablo. Thank you, Angela. As of today, Nearly 200 women uh, representing civil society have uh, been invited to address uh, the Security Council. Uh, most of this has taken place over the last five years. This is a remarkable change in council practice uh, and a development that has surely been understudied uh, and that I hope that projects like this will help um, analyze. Uh, as UN Women Specialist on the Security Council issues, I've had the, 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 the pleasure of reading all of these statements, being around for most of them, uh, have had the opportunity of facilitating uh, some of them, and I've been asked to give a 10-minute brief history uh, of uh, these briefings. So for me, uh, the timeline of this history has two key moments. Before 2000, when the Council adopts Resolution 1325, and uh, before and after 2015, uh, when the Council calls for uh, briefings from uh, women from civil society for their country-specific meetings when they're addressing specific crisis. Now, before 2000, like if you go through the 1990s, uh, you will not find any women from civil society speaking to the Council. In fact, you won't see many women at all. Um, uh, you know, the council, civil society organizations are invited also under Rule 39, which says the UN Security Council may invite 
members of the UN Secretariat or any other persons, uh, any other competent persons to you know uh, provide information to the council, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, if you know, I dug through the archives, and in the 1990s, for example, the council uses Rule 39 to invite 117 people. 110 of them uh, are men. Uh, and seven are women, none of them from civil society. At the time, most of the people that are being invited are UN um, representatives of regional organizations. I found one person that can be considered civil society and, 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 and that was a man. Now you fast forward to uh, 2003 when the council is inviting many, many more people to give you an idea, 117 people over the whole 90s compares to 300 or 400 people every single year now. So the council starts inviting women when they start inviting way, way more people, period. Um, uh, and so in 2003, there is an attempt at having an Iraqi woman brief uh, the Security Council in October, which is when the Security Council holds its annual thematic debate on women, peace and security. And this was a few months after the United States invades Iraq, and uh, this attempt is, it's, is blocked, it's considered too controversial, uh, too difficult. So we have to wait until uh, 2004, uh, when the United Kingdom, which has pretty much since then be, been the pen holder on women, peace and security issues in the Security Council, invites a Congolese activist, uh, once again, to uh, brief the council during the women, peace and security debate. Now, from then until 2015, the 15th anniversary, uh, 25 women uh, brief the Security Council on thematic debates, mostly these annual open debates on women, peace and security, but also the annual debates on conflict-related sexual violence and other thematic issues like protection of civilians or children in armed conflict. And that's how we get to 2015. Uh, the feeling among women, peace and security advocates by then was that, you know, having this annual meeting uh, be the one that had the longest list of speakers uh, every year, uh, was of dubious value because uh, you know once the council would discuss Syria or South Sudan or uh, uh, Somalia, uh, women peace and security issues would fade from view and, and, and from mention. So uh, for example, that year, uh, the council, that meeting hit a record of 112 speakers, which is the most of any council meeting uh, uh, in the history of the council on any topic. But most importantly, Spain, which is in the council at the moment, proposes a draft resolution with many new elements, but some of which were among improving the Security Council's to women, peace and security on, when it's discussing specific crises. And the two major, ma major elements of that is the creation of a sort of working group uh, devoted to women, peace and security, and to call for these briefings in country specific meetings uh, 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 for, for, for these situations. I really wish there was a that there that, that a Spanish diplomat will one day tell the story of these negotiations. Um, at least one permanent member with veto power was uh, very opposed to many of these elements, including the briefings from civil society. Uh, Spain had to use all of its diplomatic muscle. There were meetings in the capital of this permanent member. There were meetings in Madrid, meetings in New York, visits to the private residence of the ambassadors. Uh, concessions were made. Um, uh, and months of work uh, ahead of October. And in the end, the resolution did include uh, this uh, provision. Uh, and if you ask Spanish diplomats, and that narrative has a lot more on, on personal dynamics and it almost makes it sound accidental uh, that this got approved uh, rather than, um, I don't know, inevitable. And, um, and so now we have this, this provision on paper but actually for, two, for 14 months, nobody invites women from civil society uh, uh, for country specific meetings, mainly out of fear that this permanent member that had opposed it in the thematic resolution would oppose it, uh, 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 would block it. Uh, so we have to wait until Spain is again uh, uh, president of the council at the end of 2016, 14 months later. Uh, and they invite a Liberian woman, uh, which is, was probably at the time the least controversial option. And that's how it starts. That simple act changes council practice for the following years. And uh, since then, except for a drop uh, during the first months of the pandemic, the 
the, the number of women from civil society has exploded. It's growing exponentially. Um, some council members even kind of compete among themselves to see who's going to invite the most uh, women. Even the countries in the council that are perceived to be most um, allergic in a way to civil society representation in these meetings have invited women uh, to, to uh, brief the council. And the overwhelming majority of civil society briefers now are women, uh, which has helped bring the percentage of people speaking under Rule 39 from 5% in the 90s to 40% now, and even 50% if you take a look at the last two months, uh, uh, for example, where I think 24 women from civil society briefed the council in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, two months alone. This development has, has, has you know, brings out brings out lots of issues, which I am I'm sure society colleagues will illuminate. Uh, not least of which are the very real risks uh, to their lives and their activities uh, if they're harassed or, or targeted after they speak to the to the council. Um, but uh, no matter how wide the the gap between rhetoric. And, and action, uh, no matter how frustrating it may be to witness the, the, the repetitive and almost performative nature of, uh, of uh, some of these uh, meetings, um, no matter how flawed the Security Council as a whole uh, may be, even the most jaded would not pass up uh, the opportunity to have this space to speak to the Council and to, and to hold this space. Uh, for uh, civil society, which I think is something that the individual speakers have in the back of their minds uh, uh, um, as well. Uh, there was an article by Sam Cook, who uh, was quoting uh, a Congolese activist, Julian Lusenge, uh, who spoke in 2005 and 2015. She had spoken already in 2008, and she told the council, you know, I spoke to you seven years ago. Judging by the results, I had to thought, think long, long and hard whether this would be worth my time and my effort. Um, I think many activists have wondered that as well, but the answer is typically uh, uh, in, the, in the affirmative. Uh, uh, even women who were actually harassed and targeted and, and hugely put at risk and inconvenienced for a long time, I've seen come back to the council years later to brief again, defying uh, uh, all those risks. A few final observations. Uh, when, when you read these statements, uh, uh, you notice that the, there's a huge gap between the version of reality offered by many of these civil society activists and the version offered by the government of the countries where they come from, which is often invited to also speak uh, at, these, at these meetings. Uh, for example, a few weeks ago, the Sudanese activist was much more negative and much more alarmist about the situation. This was before the military coup. Uh, than the government representative who actually used his time to reject the facts of the presentation from the civil society activists. Or if you hear uh, meetings on Colombia, the, the difference between how the government portrays the imp implementation of the gender provisions of the peace agreement and how uh, Colombian activists do is, 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 is pretty significant. So in some ways, it, it serves as a reality check of, of sorts. Secondly, some people, I think some people expect uh, these statements to, full of, to be full of sort of moving and personal stories. But when you actually read them, what they're full of is of a sound policy recommendations about the issues at hand and, and what's being discussed uh, at the council. And these recommendations and messaging are actually more are consonant with the general tenor uh, of the conversation uh, at the council. Uh, they're often critical of the UN and disappointed in the UN, but they generally want more UN. Uh, uh, many of these briefers are lawyers who are actually familiar with the intricacies of UN institutional architecture, sometimes comment on them and weigh in on them. Uh, perhaps surprisingly, when they're discussing the, the drawdown or the withdrawal of, of a peacekeeping mission, uh, many of them want more peacekeeping uh, uh, rather, than, rather than less, which I think is, an, is, is something I think I wouldn't have uh, predicted. Um, they cover issues that don't get much airtime from uh, local conflict dynamics that then become much more salient years later. They're actually very good at predicting uh, uh, what's going to what's coming down the line, and obviously, you know, issues about women, peace, and security from from women-led grassroots uh, peace building to 
targeted violence against women in public life. Uh, you know, and this alone is hugely important because they provide a face and a testimony to things that uh, these government officials, you know, hear about, but they, you know, they're typically not measured. They don't see the big numbers. They don't appear in the in the official record in some ways. They're a little bit invisible, and because of that, they don't they don't get much attention or funding. Um, and finally, while it may not seem like it uh, sometimes, these statements are definitely influencing the position of many council members who increasingly echo all of these uh, themes. And this hopefully makes their governments, hopefully makes them, their governments likelier to not just speak on it, but also act on it. I think that's my 10 minutes, Angela. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Pablo. Your comments were, and your overview was really, uh, opened up a whole range of questions and issues that I think we'll hear more about, but I'm really pleased that you also were unafraid to introduce some of the critical aspects, you know, the things that we have heard about uh, civil society brief, brief, briefing, and also to, break, to, to give us an, a sense of how much things have changed and also how politically important uh, uh, the opportunity still is for briefing the council um, and, uh, and how astute and skilled briefers are um, in, in terms of understanding the policy dynamics, but also understanding the local conditions and context and needs uh, for the UN. With that, I'd like to turn to the next part of our webinar. And I'm very pleased to be able to uh, introduce our first speaker, it, Ms. Jacqueline Nasiwa, who represented and continues to represent the civil society Organization Center for Inclusive Governance, Peace and Justice. And she was invited to give a civil society perspective and recommendation to the Security Council to discuss the situation in South Sudan. And, and like Sandrine Lusamba, was, her participation was facilitated by the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security. With that, I'd like to give the floor to Jacqueline. Okay. Thank you, Angela. Uh, good evening from uh, Juba. And thank you to the Novik uh, Africa Institute and all uh, those who are participating today. I'm grateful to be sharing my perspective with you. And uh, I'll just start by saying that, uh, as Angela said, I'm one of the briefers to the Security Council. And I did uh, three briefings to the Council in regards to the South Sudan uh, situation. And I think uh, uh, I can say that uh, the women brief us to the Security Council plays a very crucial role. And that brings me as to why is women brief us to the Council very important. Uh, one thing I would say is that uh, women brief us are very objective in their presentation. And also they bring a unique perspective of the country context. And I think uh, the previous speaker uh, noted that uh, uh, there are barriers between governments and uh, what civil society brings. And if you want to compare and at least have some uh, reasonable understanding of the context and probably from an objective point of view, you can get it uh, from the women briefers. Uh, secondly, is that women briefers look not only on issues that affect women, peace and security, but broader issues that affect the nation and also affect uh, development and stability of a country. And I think that perspective will not come in a context where there's closing space, especially for South Sudan, if I could give us an example, where even political parties, the media are all censored and they cannot be able to speak. Uh, just to flag, two days ago, I had a radio program talking about transitional justice. And uh, the men who called in, they say, thank you women for speaking on issues that even us men, we cannot raise, but you are able to raise them. So that is the level of how women uh, brief us and probably women rights defenders are, are speaking on issues that affect their country. Uh, they are also part and partial of the peace implementation. Most of the women uh, brief us are engaging in peace process and uh, community uh, projects at the local level. And uh, most of them, I could say, are not even part to the conflict. And they are not at least um, 
uh, engage in activities that promote local conflicts or conflicts in the country. Uh, women briefers are very resilient, if I could say. Uh, in the case of South Sudan, looking at the civil society space now, which is very toxic and very threatening, uh, some of the civil society have left the country for fear of reprisal and intimidation. And uh, I think you read from the media that uh, some even media uh, people and civil society lost their lives. But women briefers remain uh, to be giving the hope that uh, uh, people can still live in South Sudan. And their resilience, I think, is helping to give, to give some kind of hope to the people, but also in highlighting the challenges that uh, citizens face, and particularly women and children face in this country. So the key issues that women uh, briefers highlight, uh, if I could remind, include protection and issues of accountability and particularly on sexual and gender-based violence, which is rampant and in conflict situations, it's worse. And uh, women uh, brief us, discuss about it and uh, advocate for solutions to be found. They also advocate for ceasefire. And uh, as we all know, women are the first to respond to violence. And they are the ones who are imp impacted either negatively and also they are the ones who are to be displaced and find protection for the rest of the family members. And therefore, because of that, uh, their involvement in peace securities is very crucial and they raise issues of security uh, challenges and implementation of security arrangements, particularly in South Sudan in regards to uh, chapter two, which is on uh, containment of forces and uh, screening and training of professional army. Uh, women also are the ones who are promoting the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Uh, if you want to talk about issues of the UN Security Council 1325, it's the women briefers and the women rights defenders. Like last week, we just marked the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution. But at the national level, there was no remarks on that. And there is no reflection on how far the country has gone in regards to implementation of this uh, Security Council resolution. Uh, women also participate in uh, response to COVID in terms of social service delivery. Uh, when COVID broke out in the country, uh, the government people, as you all had, uh, they contracted the COVID and there was no uh, way on how people can be educated. And the women briefers and human rights defenders were in the forefront to educate, uh, particularly women who are the caregivers in the families to COVID-19 uh, victims. Uh, they talk about corruption and they talk about legislative reforms, including the constitutional development process. And these are key um, reforms if we are to talk about democratization and also uh, uh, the civic space. And if we are to talk also about uh, good governance in a country. So what is the impact of our briefing? And I could talk from my experience and also the experience of some of my colleagues who did the briefing to the UN Security Council. Um, that following the briefing we had at the UN Security Council, we call on the UN to make follow up in regards to the peace agreement, which is shaky and was fragile and almost collapsing. So because of that, the UN Security Council sent a delegation to Cuba and this delegation met with government and pushed the government to implement uh, chapter one, which is on governance. And as the council was in country, the government announced that they are able to form their government and the cabinet and the executive. So I think that is how far uh, briefers were pushing the council to look back into the country context. The second one is that uh, uh, the security council and the special envoys, especially from the Troika countries and uh, IGAD, they were able to visit South Sudan immediately following the briefing. And that made them to have a critical discussions with the stakeholders in regards to why the peace agreement implementation was delayed. And this in particular was in regards to the formation of the parliament, which took almost one or two years uh, from the transitional period. And when the special envoys visit, and then the government was able to reconstitute the parliament. The other one is that there were steps also taken in regards to addressing sexual violence. Uh, in Yei, there was a military uh, uh, court trial, which was established to try perpetrators who are uh, men in uniform in regards to sexual violence committed against uh, women. And then uh, about uh, 28 were tried 
and victims were able to get justice, although they were not compensated for the violations that happened. Um, in Juba, there was a juvenile and uh, sexual violence uh, court, which is established now and it is functional. But the limitation is that it's addressing uh, domestic violence cases and he has not tackled yet conflict related sexual uh, violence. Uh, government has also announced the establishment of the transitional justice mechanism, uh, instructing the Minister of Justice to go ahead with the establishment of the hybrid court legislation, the Compensation and Reparations Authority, and the Commission for Truth, Healing and Reconciliation. And as I speak now, uh, I'm one of the technical committee for this uh, committee, uh, heading the public consultations and the civic engagement uh, technical committee for the establishment of this uh, transitional justice mechanism. So um, despite all these good uh, gestures in regards to the push by women briefers to the council, uh, there are still critical pending issues that may affect stability, and this requires urgent action by the council. Uh, one is in regards uh, to chapter two of the peace agreement, which is mostly on security arrangements. Um, security arrangement is one of the forgotten uh, thematic areas of the peace agreement, but it remains critical for sustainability of peace and also sustaining of the government. Uh, as we speak now, the containment process has not taken place, the armament has not taken place, and this has direct impact on women and children uh, who have been suffering sexual violence throughout. Uh, militarization and politically motivated intercommunal violence is still very rampant, and the killing that is due to this conflict is higher uh, than even the, the, the fighting between the forces, and many lives and property continue to be lost. Uh, corruption is very rampant, and I think if we talk of our oil money, even among citizens, no one will want to talk about it. Because oil revenue is not benefiting the people, and corruption is so high that the parties are the ones benefiting from it. The second one is that the wrong peace talks is silently uh, ignored at all levels. The parties can go to the discussions at will, they can choose not to, and yet uh, fighting is continuing in most parts, especially in the equatorial. And as you know, the equatorial is the backbone of the government, and if it is unstable, and then there is no stable uh, government in the country. Uh, the hybrid court remains a serious bargain between the parties, uh, given that uh, gross human rights violations has happened, and uh, the African Union is also trying to play politics of not moving this process forward. And uh, as briefers in most of my briefings and some of my colleagues we keep pushing for the establishment of the hybrid court by the African Union. And it seems the slow process in that and nothing is moving forward. Discussing with the stakeholders and the government, they say like the role of the hybrid court establishment is with the African Union and African Union is not taking any steps. And in our push with the uh, UN Security Council, we're asking for them to give more pressure or support the African Union in establishment of this court. And uh, we have not seen concrete actions in regards to moving that forward. Uh, women's participation in the peace process still remains a challenge, despite that we have the affirmative action of 35%. Uh, if you assess the women who are currently in the government, uh, you could see that the legislative assembly have tried to reach 33%, but the executive and the judiciary are still not adhering to the 35% women's affirmative action. We had had nine ministers, female, out of the 12 which are supposed to be given, but again, one is removed, so we are left with eight. And we are worried that the more this trend of replacing women with men continue, and then at the end, women would not be even in the government. And that will mean women are not part of the political processes and peace processes in this country. Uh, female briefers, I think someone highlighted, we face intimidation also, like after briefing, uh, you can be intimidated and you'll be told like you are talking too much, don't talk about these issues, they are beyond you. And as a woman, you know, uh, why do you talk about politics? And this makes it very difficult for briefers to continue to remain relevant in the space and providing accurate information. Because uh, if you are not strong, you end up twisting the part so that just you can be briefing the council for the sake of briefing. Um, Civilian areas still remain uh, militarized, like schools and civil uh, 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 civic spaces. 
And this makes it very difficult for civilians even to move freely because the containment has not taken places, forces are still moving around, and that puts them at most risk of sexual violence inclusive. And uh, uh, lastly, in regards to the challenge, I could say that uh, sexual violence is still in increase. Despite that some areas are calm, women still face sexual harassment. So what is the recommendation for the council moving forward? Uh, one is that the council need to take note of briefers. We just don't come to the council because we feel proud that we are briefing the UN Security Council. But we come to the council because there are serious issues that affect women, affect the country and affect regional peace. And therefore, if they are not addressed, and then uh, I don't see a reason why we keep coming to the council to do briefing as women brief us. Um, next time, as I stated in my last briefing, is that when we are coming to the council, we should be talking about development issues rather than always talking about the same conflict and the same issues that affect women, including sexual violence. Um, the council need to give pressure to the African Union to expedite the process of the establishment of these transitional justice mechanisms, and in particular the hybrid court, so that we end impunity against women. Uh, ensure safety and protection of female briefers. Like after briefing, there should be a follow-up discussions. And I'm happy that in the last briefing I had, there were some follow-up discussions and uh, emails from the um, chair of the briefers. And uh, for my case, it was from the US and I think from my colleague, it was from the UK. So we encourage such kind of follow-up to ensure that briefers remain safe. And also governments are aware that the briefers are legitimate stakeholders in the UN Security Council um, actions that will be taken. And finally, I will say that the UN Security Council need to adopt some of the briefers uh, inputs into their resolutions, particularly if it is context-based to the country. Because uh, sometimes you look at their resolutions, they are very parallel and nothing seems to have been taken from the briefers uh, to be part of the resolution. So I'll say that if they can adopt some of this to be part of their resolutions and come out with concrete actions uh, as follow up to what the briefers are praying for from the council, and I think it will be very meaningful and the council can be seen as uh, uh, very relevant in terms of um, adhering and uh, promoting world peace and a culture of human rights throughout the country and the world. Thank you. Jacqueline, thank you very much. Your inputs, your rich, rich, rich inputs were rem remarkably um, also uh, concentrated and, and, and actually gave us a lot of information also about the current situation in South Sudan. Uh, I want to also highlight that there are several questions that I have uh, based on your input, which I think many others would have also, those who are not insiders to the Security Council and don't have your rich experience. Uh, uh, I'm very curious to find out uh, later on from you about sort of how do you talk about taboo or difficult complex uh, issues like SGBV in the council and brief them? Are, are there processes for uh, sensitizing uh, council members and representatives for how to engage with, with civil society uh, briefers on these really difficult topics uh, so that they don't become just sort of talking points. Um, and, you know, other questions about the briefing process and the timing. Um, but these are, I'm, I'm privileged, I can just throw in these questions while I give time for our next speaker to come on board. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, that, it, it, that we will now hear from Sandrine Lusamba, who represents the organization Sofa Padi, and was invited to provide civil society perspective and recommendations to the council to discuss the situation in the DRC. So now I hand over to Sandrine. Merci, merci beaucoup, Angela. Merci à tout le monde à Nordic Africa Institute. Thank qui... you, thank you very much, Angela, for giving me this opportunity to share my experience as a woman uh, from uh, this uh, feminine organization, organization, but also as a part of civil uh, society. My name is Sandrine Lusamba, and I'm the national coordinator of Sofie Padi, which means feminine Solidar Solidar solidarity for peace and integral development. Sofie Padi is a Congolese non-governmental organization that works for the defense and promotion of the specific rights of women and girls. 
I'm going to talk about our, our organization. We work committed to the prevention uh, of sexual and gender-based violence and to finding solutions to these problems by providing holistic care to uh, SGBV victims. Um, the uh, Pacific uh, cohabitation between communities, women's leadership, women's economic empowerment, but also the participation uh, to the uh, world of policies uh, for women. On uh, March 30th, 2021, I was invited to provide a civil society perspective and recommendation when the Security Council met to discuss the situation in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo at the session that was chaired uh, by the president of the Security Council, uh, Mrs. Linda Thomas Greenfield. I had the opportunity to brief the UN Security Council on the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo by addressing our perspective on the last 20 years of the UN peacemaking mission MONUSCO. The idea was not to give my own point of view, but rather to but rather that of the Congolese civil society, more precisely of the organizations working on the issues of women, peace and security. Having now addressed a portrait of uh, that presence work and impact of MONUSCO's work for, for over 20 years, speaking before the Security Council was also an opportunity for me to continue to use my voice to an advocate for the inclusion of Congolese women. The uh, Dr. Pablo uh, Castillas uh, mentioned uh, Mrs. Lisengo that talked uh, a few years prior, and she's the one directing our organization. But last March, she actually decided to go back uh, and pay a visit to the Council of Security uh, to uh, let them know about the evolutions of the situation. This, this did not prevent me from drawing the, the attention of the board member to the need for the involvement of women at all levels of decision making, because whatever the decision uh, on the end or the extension of the peacekeeping mission in the uh, DRC, well, priority should be given to gender sensitive community engagements, which include regular consultations, which with women rights group, women peacemaker, and human rights defenders as part of the mission's regular, regular activities and public recognition of the essential role of women. Knowing that the new special representative of the UN Sec Secretary General in the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo would also be among the speakers, I had to use this opportunity to make strong points about some of MONUSCO's decisions that have failed to protect the population because given the security ch challenges facing civilian populations, particularly in the North Kivu and e, uh, in, the, in the region of Ituri, where the presence and activities of armed groups continue to pose a serious threat to the inhabitants of this area. MONUSCO is regularly criticized, even violently, for its limited capacity to protect civilians. I also drew the attention of all members to real facts of Congolese people who, because of armed conflicts, were forced to flee their homes and live in, in um, camps uh, for displaced people where uh, uh, human life no longer ha has any meaning. That was also the, the opportunity to talk about what uh, those people were going through, especially on uh, gender-based uh, sexual violence. I would like uh, uh, to uh, note that the civil society plays the role of supporting the government, ensuring that the living conditions of the citizens are improved through advocacy with policy makers and can also contribute to the development of policies to solve problems in the community. That is why we take every opportunity to speak and advocate for, for a specific situation as civil society has the right to provide an independent analysis of a given situation. 
we do seize any poss possibility to uh, voice uh, our opinion. I've uh, uh, had uh, this opportunity uh, to talk about the uh, Congolese uh, civil society because we have the right to provide our own analysis of the situation. I'm here just like Jacqueline from Sudan representing civil society, but also representing the role of women, making sure we're providing uh, relevant uh, uh, information without um, expressing our own point of view. But since I've uh, participated to uh, the councils, I have received uh, a, a letter from uh, Mrs. Linda, who told me that my remarks were welcomed by the whole delegation and that I had this feeling. Uh, I was I was very content, I was very happy because our uh, NGO was being recognized and I, would, I, I was welcoming uh, uh, the this initiative. Uh, you know that that my that all measures would would um, would soon be initiated the needs of the population and the hopes are great just as well as the government's uh, hopes and uh, we do know that civil society faces uh, uh, a lot often lacks uh, uh, in terms of means and and in order to make sure that their action would be will be sustainable given the weakness of government instance institution this civil society is an indispensable actor in the country reforms process thank you very much for your attention thank you so much sandrine uh, you actually had a few minutes left which is <laughs> remarkable so thank you very much uh, um I, will, I would like to now to actually use this time that you've given us to go straight to listen to Kavya Asoka, who is the executive director of the NGO working group that has facilitated uh, the statements by civil society briefers to um, the Security Council. And we are also all really indebted to the NGO working group on women, peace, and security because through them and through uh, Kavya's uh, participation, we were able to make contact with Jacqueline and Sandrine. And I think that we would all not be here today if it were not uh, for the important role uh, that this organization plays. And Kavya began her career uh, at, at a human rights documentation center in Delhi. Uh, and I think that that's also an important part of her biography, which I was fascinated by. Um, because I imagine that she quite rightly identifies with and understands the importance of having women from the global south contribute to the discussions and to the decision-making processes on WPS at the Security Council. I'm really delighted uh, that she's with us today. I hope that we will have time also to come back to uh, much of the things of the, of the important sort of crossover between Jacqueline and Sandrine and Kavya in terms of their experiences in the Q&A. And now I hand over to Kavya, thank you. Thanks so much, Angela. And thank you so much to the Nordic Africa Institute, PRIO and the University of Pretoria for organizing this webinar and for this invitation and to all the panelists for the really incisive presentations this morning. Um, I find myself just nodding to a lot of what I've heard this morning. So uh, I'll use my time really to reinforce what I think some of the key points that we've already heard from uh, Jacqueline, from Sandrine and from Pablo are before we go into the, the Q&A. Uh, but before that I do that, I'll just take a few minutes to talk about our work as the NGO Working Group. Um, as mentioned by Angela, I'm the director of the NGO Working Group. We're an advocacy coalition of 18 organizations, and we seek to advance the WPS agenda at the Security Council. And we advocate for women's full, equal, and meaningful participation in all aspects of peace and security. Through our member organizations, we're connected to civil society in conflict communities around the world. And a core part of our mandate is to ensure that their perspectives are being heard by decision makers 
policymakers here at UNHQ in New York, uh, and to ensure that their perspectives also inform our advocacy as the NGO working group. Uh, since 2004, we've supported about over 60 women civil society briefers from 18 countries on the Security Council's agenda uh, in 32 thematic discussions, as well as 32 country specific discussions. We've also supported many women civil society connect uh, with policymakers through important channels outside formal Security Council sessions. Um, for instance, we've supported since 2019 uh, over 30 women from 11 countries before the informal expert group meetings on WPS, which we work with uh, Pablo at UN Women uh, on organizing. So I just wanna take a second to say that given all these briefings that we've done over the years, uh, we know how much work, how much consultation, how much time and how much courage it takes for people like Jacqueline, Sandrine, and so many of the other briefers we've worked with to do this. And so we fully support them in having high expectations of what the impact of these briefings should be at the Security Council and what the expectations of the UN as well as member states should be. Um, so people like Sandrine and Jacqueline are really at the center of our work and I'm really proud to be on this panel today with them. Uh, Pablo has already given <clears throat> a really good overview of the history of these briefings, so I don't want to del dwell too much on the numbers, but perhaps just to observe again that women are the majority of civil society briefers at the Security Council, and the number and the diversity of these briefers has been increasing over the years, which we agree is a very, very positive development. Uh, so I'd like to supplement what we've heard today just by, by going back to address three broad questions. Again, why are these briefings so important? What kind of impact have they had? And what are some of the challenges that we faced um, in, in having these briefings? And I think you've heard some of them already from Jacqueline. So on why these briefings are important, uh, given that we are seeing this positive trend of women civil society briefing the council on a regular basis, I think it's a good juncture to remind ourselves that these briefings are not an end in and of themselves, but a means to an end which is that the Security Council's decisions should be informed by the views, the expertise, and the recommendations of the communities that are on the receiving end of those decisions and most impacted by them. Uh, civil society briefers, and you've heard this, you've seen this live now with uh, Jacqueline and Sandrine on this panel, they bring a wealth of information, up-to-date information, expertise, and experience to the Security Council, including by highlighting often marginalized perspectives and raising issues that would otherwise be overlooked in favor of political considerations by Security Council members. The tendency of the international community to focus largely on high-level formal processes often overlooks a deeper understanding of the complexity of these crises, um, and importantly, the central role of women peace builders, human rights defenders, and civil society organizations who are on the front lines of these conflicts, whether they're providing essential services or resolving conflicts. So CSO briefings are important because they expand the understanding of policymakers, both on women's rights specifically, but also about specific aspects of the conflict or its root causes. I think Pablo mentioned this earlier as well. Just to bring that to life with a couple of examples, uh, you've uh, obviously heard both Jacqueline and Sandrine's statements, but another uh, example would be uh, Carolina Tim, another South Sudanese activist who we supported earlier this year, also from South Sudan, who focused her statement on the issue of women with disabilities and the fact that they're two to three times more likely to experience gender-based violence and uh, in conflict, drawing on the work of her own organization in South Sudan. This was the first time a deaf woman briefed the Security Council, which was earlier this year. We also recently supported, for instance, Celia Menza Velasco, an indigenous leader from the Cauca region of Colombia, who addressed why indigenous communities oppose large-scale extractive infrastructure projects um, because they're detrimental to the environment, deplete natural resources, and how this indigenous community was being attacked for doing so. Now I'm raising these two examples just to say that neither of these perspectives uh, would be heard by council members if not for these civil society activists raising them. And we as the NGO working group always try to prioritize diverse marginalized or otherwise unheard perspectives in our own process of nominating uh, and supporting women civil society brief the Security Council. 
We supported the first Palestinian woman to brief the Security Council, the first woman to brief from a disability rights perspective, the first Syrian woman, the first Afro-Colombian woman. So we tried to, to really bring in voices that have not been heard by council members. Uh, second point I want to make on this is just that civil society can often be more effective than international actors in settling local disputes or providing services such as humanitarian or development assistance. These are, of course, their own communities, and they have very valuable insights into what drives these conflicts, as well as what the best solutions are. Uh, and this goes back to Jacqueline's point about what should happen with the recommendations that the civil society make to the Security Council? What weight should be given to them? And I'll come back to that in just, just a second. Uh, just another example of this, uh, I know we're focused on Africa, but there are so many global examples to draw from as well. Uh, Yemeni activists have consistently highlighted, for example, the mother of abductees association who were excluded from the Stockholm peace talks, but have negotiated the release of more than 940 arbitrarily detained persons. Meanwhile, there was no progress through the UN-led process at the time. Yet when we've nominated uh, members of the Mother of Abductees Association to brief the Security Council, uh, Security Council members have not taken us up on that uh, nomination. This is all to say that these briefings, without these briefings, the critical perspectives of individuals and communities who are directly affected by the council's decision-making are not being heard nor are council members making decisions with a full picture of the situation on the ground. The council only stands to benefit from these briefings and learning from and supporting these strategies when civil society is present. Uh, lastly, I just want to say that women must be heard from directly and regularly. Uh, and I think this is a point we can come back to. Uh, I see that I only have three minutes left, so I'm going to quickly skip ahead to, to two points I wanted to make. Uh, one was on the impact. Now, we recognize as advocates that the impact and influence are dynamic and fluid concepts, and it's often difficult to pinpoint a single event like a civil society briefing having an impact on Security Council action. That having been said, we do think it's very important not only to support civil society briefings for their own sake, but for the content of those briefings to make a meaningful impact on the Council's decision making, and for it to have a positive effect on women's civil society in those communities. That's, after all, the point of these briefings. Um, so I just want to point you to some research, and I'm happy to talk about this in the, in the Q&A that we did with Oxfam, one of our working group members, called Do Our Voices Matter, which examined how meaningful this participation uh, of women's civil society has been between 2017 and 2019. And the report drew from civil society briefers from three countries, South Sudan, Yemen, and Afghanistan, who have regularly briefed the council over this period. And I want to share uh, two observations from this report, but would encourage all of you to, to take a look at it. We can drop a link to it in the chat uh, during the Q&A. The first finding was that when we surveyed Security Council members, 100% of them said that they believed it was important to include women civil society from conflict communities as briefers at the Security Council, 100% of the people that we interviewed. And that the top reasons for doing so were to understand the barriers they face to participation, to shape opinions on priorities and what actions they should take, and to hear perspectives they may not hear otherwise. But the survey also showed us that despite the extent to which council members state that they value women's civil society, the information shared by briefers did not consistently impact their work. Only 46% of the respondents reported a high impact. <clears throat> This means that while member states often welcome civil society, as Pablo said, they often compete with each other to have more civil society during their presidencies, during their time on the council. This is not necessarily translating into concrete action, such as, for example, the shaping of national commitments, national statements, or council products. This is definitely an area where comprehensive and systematic research needs to be done. Our research was a, a pre preliminary scoping exercise. Um, but for us, the goal should be less about tracking the impact than identifying the factors to increase the impact of these civil society briefings. The, the other point I just want to raise here is that from the perspective of the women activists that we interviewed across these three contexts, their consistent perception was that the Security Council has the power to effect tangible change when it chooses to do so uh, by applying sustained political pressure on a government or on warring parties, 
And this lack of impact therefore reflects a lack of political will from Security Council members and the fact that they're not consistently responsive to the voices of local civil society. So uh, again, just going back to Jacqueline's very important point, uh, I think from a civil society perspective, we would like to see the priorities and recommendations made by women civil society, not only reflected in the engagement of council members, but in the council's actual discussions, decision-making and products. Otherwise, civil society participation is superficial, tokenistic and extractive and impact and follow up is really quite critical for, for these briefings to achieve their full potential. Um, I think I'll stop there because I've probably run out of time, but the one issue that perhaps we can talk about a little bit more in the Q&A is the issue of reprisals and some of the negative repercussions from, from these civil society briefings. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kavya. Great, thank you. This is a great segue actually to our next speaker. And, and I will park this question about reprisals and this topic about reprisals for our, our Q&A. But it gives me great pleasure now to welcome uh, Dr. Sitembele Mbeti, who is our partner and a colleague and collaborator working on the Shattering Glass project on, on advancing women, peace and security uh, with, through the elected states. And um, Sitembele is, as I've said earlier, she's, a, she's at the University of Pretoria and her particular expertise is um, on women, peace and security, on political participation, but also South Africa's foreign policy during its two elected terms in the UN Security Council in 2007, 2008, and 2011-2012. Um, Sitembele, welcome. Uh, it would be very interesting to hear from you about the challenges that civil society face also. Uh, as a segue from what Kavya, meant, Kavya reported on this survey, if 100% of Security Council member states welcome input from civil society briefers, from women civil society briefers, there's a limited political will in terms of actually translating their recommendations into decisions and council products. Is it any better at the national level and is it any better in Africa? And I hand over to you. Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction and uh, really huge thanks to the other speakers um, who I think have laid such an excellent groundwork for some of the remarks I'm going to make. I'm going to try to speak for, um, you know, for less than 10 minutes so that we can actually have proper time for Q&A because I think um, there's a lot of richness that's going to come from there. Um, I want to focus uh, specifically, so as Angela said, I my, my doctorate was looking at uh, South Africa's two elected terms, uh, first two elected terms in the Security Council, um, and South Africa then served on the Security Council again in 2019 and 2020, and this was then after um, the resolution on um, having civil society briefers, um, on country specific issues um, and, and the real um, scaling up of that practice in the Security Council. So when I was asked to prepare for, for, for today, um, I thought I would basically touch on three issues. The first is on the way in which African elected members of the council operate um, and kind of what agency they have and what kind of interaction they have both with the UN, with other elected 10 members and the UN Security Council in general, but also with the African Union um, and, and what the implications of that then are for civil society briefers. The second is I wanted to just do a bit of a deep dive on South Africa um, and its take and its view on women, peace and security, but also its record in terms of civil society briefers um, during its presidencies uh, of the council. And then the final thing I want to just highlight a bit is perhaps some opportunities um, going forward uh, that they may be to engage uh, African elected members more um, in terms of um, Firstly, including civil society briefers, uh, 
far more, but also using the engagement with African civil society briefers uh, to try to impact on policy on the continent. So the first thing on um, the A3, so uh, the there's always three African member states um, that are elected to the Security Council. Um, having a seat on the council is a ro is rotated uh, by region, um, and and so we tend to find that the elections uh, for a seat at the Security Council amongst African states aren't really that contested openly uh, because those are decisions that are made in terms of the rotational plan, but also um, they are made at the level of the regional economic um, at the re of the regional economic bodies. Um, and but while there is that kind of cooperation in terms of getting elected to the council, what we've seen over the years is that there hasn't been a great deal of cooperation amongst African members on the council um, and many different um, sort of divisions showing their heads, whether that is linguistic divisions or, um, or, or regional divisions that have shown themselves between the African three members. That began to change around 2013, 2014, where uh, Rwanda went during its term in the Security Council um, at a high level um, AU meeting, um, decided or or promoted the establishment of the A3 as a caucus and as a means of connection and communication between the Security Council, um, between the UN Security Council and the African Union Peace and Security Council on issues of common concern. And so what we've seen since that time is a lot more deliberate cooperation amongst the A3 on issues that the AU has a common position on. Um, and so an issue like Western Sahara, for example, where there is a great deal of disagreement within the AU on that issue, um, you don't get much cooperation on that amongst A3 members. Um, but what you saw, for example, in, 20, uh, in, in 2019 was cooperation amongst the A3 um, in the Security Council on Sudan. So um, you have seen a lot more cooperation amongst the A3 since then, but a lot of that cooperation is based on positions that are taken in the AU um, and in consultation with the African Union. Um, and so whilst there's been an increase in the areas that there's cooperation on, I think in 2019, uh, the A3 made, uh, I think it was 20 joint statements, which is uh, quite extraordinary around different issues that were in the council. Um, that does not take away from the kind of individual foreign policies of the A3 member states. And a lot of that can then make the lives of a civil society briefers very difficult because the regional real politic um, that they uh, are facing in their particular countries then plays out often um, at the Security Council in terms of how much engagement they can actually have with um, African member states. And as an illustration of that, the second point I want to talk about then is South Africa's record in 2019 and 2020 uh, of engaging with civil society uh, briefers and bringing civil society briefers into the meetings that it had control over as the president, I think it was Pablo who, who, who spoke about how elected member states are able to use the, their presidencies of the council um, to, to, to influence uh, the agenda of the council. And so Spain did that um, in order to invite a civil society on a country specific issue. And what we see when we look at South Africa's presidencies, both in October of 2019 and then in December of 2020, is that South Africa only invited civil society briefers for thematic issues. It never invited civil society briefers on country specific issues, uh, even though during its period, during its period as a presidency of the council, um, there were issues dealt with like on the DRC, on Mali, on Sudan and on South Sudan. Um, in all different cases, 
um, of those country specific issues, um, there were no civil society briefers invited, but civil society briefers were invited in 2019 on youth peace uh, and conflict, uh, youth peace and security, and the, the big thematic debate that South Africa organized, and then certainly also on women, peace, and security um, in October of 2019. And so, what that indicates is that despite South Africa's um, um, speaking favorably uh, of including civil society actors of that uh, speaking often that the Security Council need to take needs to take the voices of those who are affected by civil society of uh, by um, Security Council decisions seriously um, you haven't seen that backed up by action um, when the country had an opportunity to uh, whilst holding the presidency of uh, of different, um, while holding the presidency of the Security Council at different times. And I think this may indicate a kind of clash between the way in which you can sort of posture and behave at the Security Council and then being aware of the realities of managing um, continental politics um, and not wanting to uh, anger or, 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 or to um, or to affect relations uh, with other countries on the continent by bringing in civil society actors. And so then the final thing that that leads me to is that I think that there is, and in the report um, that uh, Ms. Ahsoka uh, referred to, uh, there is something that's put in play, there's a point that's made there, that I think that there is an opportunity for civil society actors to engage with the African Union Peace and Security Council and to use the African Union um, as an entry point in being able to uh, influence some of the decisions of African countries um, that are uh, elected members on the Security Council, given the kind of um, connection and communication that we're seeing increasing uh, between A3 members um, and, uh, and, and the AU. Um, and, uh, and also using the formalized A3 caucus um, as an entrance for informal engagement um, and engaging and, and using that informal engagement to lobby for uh, civil society to be able to be more involved in country specific issues on the council. I'm going to end it there and hand back to Angela uh, so that we can go into our Q&A. Thanks so much, Cisambele, great. Thank you very much. This was a, such a rich, rich presentation. And we have a few questions from the Q&A. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think I've mentioned a couple of the questions that I have, um, um, but I'm going to hold back now and allow, um, I'm going to present a few of the questions that have come through the Q&A, and perhaps some of you will be able to take the questions and some of you will, 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 will pass, but this has really um, been a rich, rich presentation. Um, I think, and I want to sort of summarize going, going backwards a little bit. Um, the last question we, we've seen in the Q&A um, has been from Anna from Plan, and, and she asks, I know youth have been part of briefings around YPS, youth peace and security, but are you also looking uh, at the age of female briefers on country specific or WPS um, issues and themes? And she says she appreciates point that we've pointed out, or you've pointed out that a woman with a disability was recently invited, but have girls been invited in looking at children and, and armed conflict? And I think that perhaps Pablo might be able to comment upon this generally from what he knows about briefings, other briefings to the Security Council. Um, the, the other question uh, comes from Jingare Jing Ibrahim Maida, and the question is really about the current state, I think, of, of implementation of 1325 and national action plans. So perhaps you, any of you would like to take that question about the implementation of national action plans. Um, and then the first question is from Dr. Angelina Bazuka, um, who talks about the increasing shrinkage of civic space um, and asks, how this platform, and I'm not sure if she means 
I think she means the Security Council platform can really communicate ideas around uh, violence, intimidation, threats. And here, I think it would be a great opportunity to hear a little bit about reprisals to briefers and the consequences that briefers experience, both in terms of talking about these difficult issues um, individually, but also in their communities, and also the 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 sort of vulnerability of human rights defenders and 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 reprisals that that Kavya mentioned. So let me start with Pablo, and and then we'll take a round, and I will try to facilitate. Pablo. Help me, colleagues. Uh, I don't think a girl has ever briefed the Security Council. Uh, young women have. Uh, I, um, you know, for example, Nuji Mustafa, who I think is the person that Kavia was referring to before. Uh, she was a girl when she escaped Syria and did her famous travel uh, to Germany, but she was a young woman when she actually briefed uh, the Security Council. Uh, Yeni Londoño, uh, who I think was mentioned in the other webinar, uh, you know, came because of her experience as a girl uh, forcibly recruited into an armed group. Uh, but when she briefed, she was already uh, over 18. Uh, so I don't know of any, of any examples of uh, uh, girls briefing the Security Council. Uh, many young women uh, have, uh, but there are women in their 20s and, and, and things like that. Thank you. Um, Kavya, would you like to come in and, and kind of talk a, lot, a little bit about reprisals to briefers? Yes, uh, thank you, Angela. Um, I definitely think the issue of reprisals against civil society briefers and the question that was posed around shrinking civil society space, these are very linked because the reprisals that we see against women's civil society are of course a reflection of the situation on the ground and the issues that they work on on a daily basis for which they're targeted and persecuted. So I don't see these as, as disconnected. They're very much part of the same, same question. Um, I mean, as the number of women's civil society briefing the council have increased, obviously so have the repercussions for them doing so. Um, and I think Jacqueline had mentioned the issue of sexual and gender-based violence, accountability, corruption. These are all really hard and difficult issues that women's civil society consistently and courageously raise. So it's not unexpected that they would face repercussions for doing so. That having been said, uh, I have to share that for us as the NGO working group over the years, the, the women that we've worked with have faced a range of intimidation threats and reprisals including right before sitting down at the Security Council chamber. They've had their laptops confiscated. They've been uh, stopped by security forces. Letters have been written questioning their credibility or their ability to speak on certain issues, which their national governments consider to be going against their culture or, or um, national the religious and moral values uh, of the country in question. So, uh, this is, this is a very real issue. And we see the purpose of reprisals as to silence women human rights defenders from speaking out on these difficult issues for criticizing their governments and for doing their human rights work. So I really want to just say that this is about political violence. This isn't about cultural norms. This is not about the vulnerability of women. This is really about deliberate acts intended to silence them. And so, uh, what we've called on Security Council members as well as the UN to do is really to offer both practical and political support to both prevent reprisals from taking place, as well as to respond to them when they do occur, and to support the work of women human rights defenders more broadly. Uh, again, we've reiterated uh, what I think Jacqueline put very eloquently, which is that if women are taking these risks to brief the Security Council, and uh, I think Pablo mentioned this as well, despite the risks, despite the cynicism of what the Security Council will actually do, they continue to see that as an important space to hold and to address the international community. Then I think it's the international community's obligation to ensure that they can do so safely. Um, 
We've also, and, and I think this is a very important point that I just want to emphasize, is where coming back to this issue of vulnerability and uh, why these attacks take place. Again, this is really not about vulnerability. This is about enabling women's participation. It's not about keeping them from speaking out on these issues. It's not about protecting them. Uh, in a paternalistic way. It's about enabling them to continue to do the work that they do. And this is something we've pushed for uh, very hard. And lastly, I think Sandrine mentioned this, preserving the independence of women civil society speakers and their ability to speak on these issues freely without fear and without interference from Security Council members, from the UN, from INGOs, but to really speak truth to power and to use that space in order to do that. Uh, I'll stop there. That was a long answer to a, to a short question, but thank you, Angela. No, thank you. Thank you very much. May I just ask Jacqueline and Sandrine, I'm going to turn to the two of you now. I wondered if you could talk a little bit or tell us a little bit about the state of, I mean, you've already explained quite a lot of the gaps in terms of implementation and you've, you've, you, you've really kind of underscored the importance of translating Security Council, the recommendations you brought to the council to actual impact on the ground and underscored that in particular areas around DDR, for instance, or around preventing and addressing sexual and gender-based violence, the role of MONUC. Could you talk a little bit about sort of the national action plans and what you know about national action plans in, in your respective a national context. Uh, I think that this will help us get at some of the questions uh, around the current state of implementation of the WPS agenda. Jacqueline, maybe you'd like to go first. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. I think I'll talk about the national uh, action plan because um, I mentioned also uh, the Security Council resolution. Um, our national action plan was adopted in 2015 to 2020. And I could say that uh, this national action plan remained a beautiful paper, which was developed with the support of uh, UN and uh, implementation was not done. Uh, most of the people, even including those at the grassroots are not aware of this national action plan. And uh, uh, that gives a gap in terms of implementation of this resolution at the grassroots where issues of women, peace and security are critical. Um, in terms of women's participation, if I can compare the national level and the state level, at least at the national level, women's representation is fairer. But when you look at the state level, um, like out of uh, 10 governors, only one is a female. Um, out of uh, more than uh, 25, I could say like uh, independent commissioners, only two are women. And the three administrative areas, none was a woman. So this is because women at the local level have not understood the national action plan. And uh, the local authorities or local government are neither aware of this uh, national action plan. So uh, this document was not implemented. In terms of uh, looking at the prevention of sexual violence, our government, for example, has signed a communique with the UN uh, Office of uh, Sexual Violence Prevention, uh, Bangura. And this communique remains also on paper in terms of prevention of the sexual violence. Uh, in terms of launching that report, it was all over the media and all this, but we still see women are having sexual violence. The UN Human Rights Commission has documented sexual violence against um, uh, women in this country. And uh, this report was elaborate, but the UN has taken no action in ensuring that the communique they sign uh, where the government commit to look into issues of sexual violence and prevent its um, uh, continuous violations have not been taken in place. So even if the UN, the U, the UN Human Rights Commission documented this sexual violence, it remained a UN document and the government is not bothered because they are not being pushed to take concrete actions in addressing this. Uh, that means that uh, even if we have now the new NAP, which is um, adopted this month prior to the marking of the 20th anniversary, like last Friday, 
Um, and then it's just adopting it so that the UN will say like, okay, South Sudan has this document and we are working together as part of the UN family, you know, but I'm afraid also it will remain this beautiful paper without actions being taken. So what needs to be done, the national action plan, even if it is at the domestic level, it's part of the UN documents that each country has adopted. And that means there should be some periodic reports to the UN on the status of this implementation. So that it doesn't wait until after another five years and then uh, we start looking like, hey, for example, South Sudan ways your report for the last five years in the implementation of this NAP. And then uh, uh, we start looking at how this uh, report can be designed when actually in reality, women have continued to suffer and uh, uh, they are not even participating in these critical processes uh, throughout the country. Thank you, Jacqueline. I'd like to give Sandrine an opportunity to come in here uh, about the, the sort of the national context and the national plans and, and to also, you know, because I, because we're running out of time, I'm going to be a little bit uh, uh, dictatorial here and suggest also that Sandrine could, in, you know, briefly sort of touch upon something that Sitembele raised and introduced, which is the way in which civil society at the, uh, can also engage the African Union Peace and Security Council. So um, in a way to sort of solve this problem of lack of implementation, and also to give, to create and expand more opportunities for civil society briefers to, in, to intervene and, and engage in the process. Um, maybe Sandrine would be able to also make some comments about the, the role of the African Union Peace and Security Council vis-a-vis -vis the UN Peace and Security Council, if there's any room there that she's identified uh, as an entry point for engaging. But, but first, we'll, we'll hear from you very, very, very briefly about the, the national context and national action plans. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. So as you know, my country is going through a lot of conflicts and it's been like that for several years. And in 2018, the, uh, uh, RDC relaunched the national plan uh, for the second ed par generation part. And, and the center of this plan had five different pillars, partic uh, participation of women, prevention, protection, but also the recovery. And amongst these four t um, topics, um, you, you probably can see the link between the women and the situation of the country and how women can get involved at all level. And we've been uh, suffering from this lack of implementation, even though uh, the 1525 declaration uh, was uh, uh, launched, we have no possibility to implement through programs or through activities, uh, uh, ways to sim simply uh, translate uh, the uh, government's commitment. We suffer here from a lack of commitment on behalf of the government. The second generation had been launched with the support of international organization like uh, UN uh, Women, but we, will, we would also like to see uh, how our government c c could enga engage. We, all, we are here to support the government's actions. So in order for this action to be sustainable and for this national plan to be really implemented, we would need a full commitment on behalf of the government, which is not currently happening. And uh, since 2018, 20, 21, it's been now three years. And we haven't noticed any goodwill to implement uh, uh, all of these initiatives. And I would like to highlight that um, our Republic should seize this opportunity uh, that, that it has uh, because we are now under the uh, African Union governance and 
the matter of uh, uh, implication of involvement is is really important if you, you observe how many women have been participating to all policies in the past years we are now reaching 14 percent in terms of uh, participation uh, uh, in, in the government. This shows how strong the will is on behalf of women. And, but we, we do need the support of our government. Thank you so much, Sandrine. I, I am afraid we have run out of time, but we have one more intervention and in input, and that is from Professor Sipamandla Zondi. Uh, who will come in and give us a little bit of a wrap up and then I will close and we will all say goodbye. But I just wanted to say it's been a pleasure to listen to all of you and to hear your comments and your inputs and I'll hand over now to Professor Zondi. Prof, please take the floor. Good afternoon. Um, uh, and thanks very much uh, to the, the speakers and to the to the hosts. Uh, it's been a, a a wonderful conversation um, that has echoes with many conversations related to uh, the subject of inclusion and agency and participation, especially in the in the United Nations in regional organizations, in sub-regional organizations generally. Um, the common refrain is always that the, the space has been opening for a period of time and that the, it, thanks to the efforts that have been made by state and non-state actors alike, that the space for inclusion has been increasing, has been expanding, but that the inclusion is not adequate, that inclusion may be unbalanced, that the inclusion is not consistent, and that the inclusion uh, is not substantive. That there is, has been for a long time a challenge, an outcry. I remember going back to the World Social Forum, where civil society organizations met in Porto Alegre in Brazil that the, the, the big challenge we're going to face is that we're going to win the battle for, for inclusion as a procedure, that there would be a briefer, there would be a platform, there would be a slot, but that inclusion does not translate to substantive inclusion. And that's why that come from a number of presentations here indicating that though there has been inclusion, there's space in there, but it says that the space shrinks at some point, expands at some point, and that the space depends on who is leading at a particular time, and that the space sometimes, often is mediated by those who are embedded in the system. Those who are embedded in the system are states. States are embedded in the system, then they invite civil society into the space. Uh, Critical civil society uh, thinking has been pointing out for a long period of time the dangers of invited space, um, while not arguing uh, only for protest space, because that too has its own limitations. But then simply saying, we need to think about how do we harness the open spaces uh, so that they are not simply procedural uh, spaces where you are allowed to talk while we have coffee, and then you leave, we go back to take this conversation seriously. How, how do you get uh, states to take the conversation seriously? How do you take, get the states to think very carefully about the recommendations of civil society? How do you get the states uh, to see the, the voices of citizens as equally concerned about the big issues that are on the table, be it in the building institutional capacity for sustaining peace, or be it uh, uh, um, uh, deepening uh, the mechanisms, the deepening the, 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 the means for building the actual peace 
uh, be it um, strengthening peace keeping, uh, strengthening uh, peace support, uh, strengthening post-conflict reconciliation, that uh, post-conflict reconstruction and so on. That, that we need to think about how to get the states to think that for a large measure, to a large measure, what the civil society formations are looking for, what citizens are looking for, is actually what the states may be looking for to a large measure. And therefore understand that what the IH, what we're actually saying from the sidelines may assist them to do that. That takes us to the question around um, how do you move from voice to impact? Now having a voice is what we've been talking about to a large measure it's happening. There are limitations, the girls, people with disability and all that. There may be limitations there, but by and large, there is that voice. The idea of the briefers is a victory, major victory. But how do you move from the voice to choice? And how do you move from voice to choice and then move to impact, a real bearing, a real uh, change and all that? That is about how do we uh, use, how do we uh, redefine the space to become a, a space for catalysis, for creating possibilities, a space for um, for achieving certain uh, certain ends that may manifest in some change, either change in the behavior of the state or change in the manner in which we implement things on the ground. Seems to me that uh, one of the things that comes out of here that is a precious opportunity in two areas, uh, very specifically, one in the linkage between the United Nations system itself and national mechanism or region, regional and national mechanisms, such as the, the coordination between UN Security Council and regional organizations on peace and security. That there might be an opportunity in that linkage for civil society, for, for citizens uh, to catalyze change a, a, a lot more. But that would require civil citizens uh, to speak to regional organization the same message that they speak to the United uh, Security Council, the United Nations Security Council, at the same time, so that the message is synchronized and all of that. That is speak to coordination. Because often the people who are briefing in New York aren't quite the people who are meandering around the, sp the spaces in Addis Ababa to try and influence. But unless the two of them speak to each other, unless they and other global civil society organizations speak together, we will, we will continue to see limitations in how to do. And that speaks to questions of coordination, of, of synergy, that speaks to issues, questions of facilitation and relationship building among civil society organizations themselves. Because we are stronger when we have those platforms where you iron out issues. Um, the extent to which the second area of opportunity is the national action plans, which are actually formal mechanisms by which nations account for their commitments internationally. Now, if the civil society formations are not fully involved, included, invited, uh, participating in the actual development of the national action plans, then we have a problem. Um, we were discussing here in South Africa recently uh, about the national action plan relating to socioeconomic rights. Uh, the country had delayed submitting the reports for a period of time, but then there was a discussion um, that um, civil society had to force. Uh, a few civil society formations were invited mainly human rights NGOs are invited and to part of a process rather than end. Those civil society organizations said, you are not signing up or, or this off until we have dialogues across the country. If we cannot have dialogue in all nine provinces, we then can at least have dialogues in four or five uh, provinces and hear from people on the ground, what are their experiences. There you had civil society that is included demanding the inclusion of the other that has not been included. 
So the actual process of uh, participatory national action plan development and reporting can be a, a huge opportunity. Definitely reporting, uh, which the UN increasingly required to be participatory, can be an opportunity for civil society organizations uh, to, to participate. The definitely the, the, the role of women, uh, the role of girls, uh, the role uh, of other in, excluded people uh, in the entire process is, is a question that will be with us for a long period of time. That is partly because the problems we're talking about are not always conjectural, are not always incidental. They are often structural. And therefore, the very fact that women bear the brunt of violence in North and, East and South Kivu in the, in the DRC has to do with the fact that this conflict itself is produced by structural conditions that place women and girls at the bottom of the ladder. So you don't address the conflict issue without addressing also the development question and, and all of that, unless you're looking for quick wins and that often do not, do not last. Um, lastly, it seems to me that there are uh, a lot of experiences that we have, we have, we have, we have uh, acquired uh, that we can use uh, to push for greater change at national level, regional level, and at global level, uh, including to this platform that the Nordic Africa Institute has created uh, for us to look at what has been done and what has not been done, and also to look at what are the opportunities that, that can come. Uh, what uh, has been said here about some states being willing uh, to much more willing to invite civil society. It is a victory, but it's not always a, a good victory because that ability to invite and invite some is, is, is fraught with some, some dangers, but there's a great opportunity there. Uh, now that we know that state A, B, D, and F are much, a lot more willing to engage we need to be thinking very carefully when those states join the United Nations Security Council as non-permanent members, to think about how to engage with them beforehand because you know they tend to be willing. So that we don't waste our energy on the states we know they are not willing to do that. You, you use another strategy for that. How do we place those issues beforehand so that we're not invited participants, but we are influential participants? But that's a question uh, of history. That's a question that will be with us for a long period of time. But thank you very much for stimulating conversations. Uh, we've heard a lot about the challenges and in them are also opportunities uh, to do much better. Indeed, we need to learn and we need to continue this conversation. Thank you very much for illuminating conversation. And it was really a, 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 a insightful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Zondi. I want to thank all the participants, the audience members, the questions, this, the presentation of the rich experiences of civil society briefers, the uh, NGO working group on women, peace and security, our partners, the University of Pretoria and the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. Um, and obviously to also thank UN Women and, 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 and your participation today. I have to say goodbye to you because time is well over and I thank you and I'm hopeful that we can continue to have future discussions and dialogues on this important issue. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>